So we're going to get started. Everyone, welcome to our NPA, Wards 4 and 7. Um, I think I'm supposed to be looking over here. Uh, welcome, everyone. I wanted to um, go over the ground rules for tonight. Listen to others speaking, respect the agenda and process, share your opinion politely, and treat people respectfully. Um, we're trying a little bit different format, so bear with us. We also had a cancellation from Burlington Electric, so we may be out of here early tonight. Um, but before we go into um, community announcements and comments, we have a couple of um, housekeeping items for our uh, <coughs> steering committee. We'd like to um, nominate two new people. Um, first is Bridget Matheson from Ward 4, and I nominate Bridget. Yep. And if everyone could support her in her nomination, especially Carol, your Ward 5. Second. Second. Um, and we have Lee that Matt's going to nominate because he's Ward 7. Yes, on behalf of Ward 7, I would like to, uh, to nominate Lee Morgan. <laughs> Any other Ward 7 folks? Do we have any Ward 7? Could you second that? Sure. All right. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any community announcements or comments? For the room? We're going to um, start off with our legislators, and Carol is going first, if there aren't any announcements. Okay. Carol is going to go first, and we're starting asking um, our elected officials to give a little background on the work that they do, committees they're on, um, assignments um, and priorities that they're working on. So with that in mind, if you could give a little background on that, um, then we'll ask the room if they have any questions. We wanted to try to get what's on everyone's mind before you give your formal presentation to our, for all elected officials. Um, so we're trying a little bit of a different agenda, so we definitely get folks in the room. There aren't too many tonight, but when there are more, we want to get the folks in the room's questions definitely answered before we run out of time. So. Um, that was a tweak that we've been working on a couple months now. With that, Carol, would you like to start with, um, you are in session, but when you are in session, what um, committees are you working on? Or um, Okay, thanks, Jeff. So I'm so grateful to be able to serve in the legislature and represent you all in District 6, uh, Chittenden, now it's ATLs, is to keep our forests unfragmented. And we are a little bit losing that battle, but we're working on that. And to keep wildlife corridors open or to reopen them because as, first of all, people need to be able to recreate in the woods, second, in the forests, that's different from woods. And second, with climate change, the animals will be migrating from the south up through Vermont and they need to be able to get up through and to keep going north. We don't want animals to get stuck anywhere because they will bring different diseases and so forth with them. They, they need to be able to keep moving through. Um, and we expect uh, human migration too. And so how we develop is very important. And in fact, a priority of mine uh, was to make sure we had enough money uh, for water and sewer in our small towns and villages to be uh, upgraded so that uh, people who want to build there, developers, whatever, would build in those town and city centers. So that's land use planning end of it. I'm also on the Lake Champlain Citizens Advisory Committee. I, I'm still on that now. Um, we meet with Quebec and New York and we work on the health of the lake. The most important things that we are dealing with are toxins and invasive species. Once an invasive species is here, you have to deal with it forever. So we are trying to keep them out of Lake Champlain. Um, and in fact, the locks down there from the Hudson River, we are working to close those locks. Almost no one uses them anymore. And some very bad things are trying to come into our lake from there. 
um, let's see. Um, I am. Uh, I am now on the House Ways and Means Committee. House Ways and Means deals with how to raise revenue for the state, and it deals a lot with education finance, which is super important for the whole state and super important for Burlington. And um, a huge priority of mine um, was uh, six years ago I introduced a bill that um, said we should update the formula and change the weights so that the same tax rate we are able to bring in far more money um, for our, uh, our students, our schools, and our taxpayers. And finally, we were able to pass that. And um, we uh, will see that will start in 2024. It's been a long, long, hard, hard road. Hardest thing, I think, one of the hardest things I've ever done. And didn't do it alone. Um, Martin Gulick was big on that. Um, let's see, I am, I was able on the House Ways and Means, I was accepted to the Harvard Kennedy School for Public Policy, and this past summer I spent two weeks learning about tax administration and tax policy um, with people from around the world. And what one of the takeaways is, we're trying to figure out how do you tax in order to help people who are poor and in order to um, have a, a fair tax system where everybody's in and um, everyone's paying, uh, you know, people aren't afraid to file for taxes and, and, um, and anyway, um, that was fabulous and I will bring um, what I've learned there to the State House, especially with some of the things the taxpayer advocate, Vermont has one, um, has been asking for for taxpayers to make things fair for them. Um, I have been assigned to the Sports Betting Study Committee, and I'm hoping that from that, uh, the, the movement is to make sports betting uh, allowable in Vermont, and we will be able to protect people who are betting anyway and some of them have lost quite a bit of money because they've been betting without the protection of the state, and also um, to uh, bring in revenue to the state. And my hope is that although some of that revenue will be siphoned to the Department of Mental Health for addiction gambling, I am working on trying to get money for uh, financial literacy, K through death. Basically, we and I'm also very interested in the Green Mountain Secure Retirement Account um, that um, Treasurer Beth Pierce has been working on. You know, when a business starts a business, if you're a plumber, you want to plumb. You don't want to have to deal with every other thing, right? So one thing the state of Vermont can do to make things easier if you're in business is to say, oh, well, um, we have this. Green Mountain Secure Retirement Account, everybody who works for you can sign up for it, you can sign up for it, and then you can focus on what you do best, which is to um, plumb buildings. Um, the, um, I'm also on the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. You have to tell me about, I'm trying to talk till Emma gets here, because I know she's a little late. No, Bob's here on, on the Zoom. Oh, okay. You don't have to stretch. All right. Is my time up yet, then? Yeah. Okay. Billy, you covered all. Well, I could talk about my priorities later, but I'm on the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. When we pass a law, there have to be sometimes regulations written to put that law into effect. The governor and his administration or her administration has to start writing those regulations. They go through a public process, and they come to our committee um, we're made up of half senators, half representatives, and we have to look at them and make sure they went through the correct process. And if we see a problem, we have to point that out, and that's what that committee does. So that's it's a very important committee, actually. <laughs> it's very good. It's a. I just want to say that what I learned from that and from, like when when. It's just 
the United States of America and our democracy is so incredibly wonderful. And there are all these checks and balances in place. And the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules is one of those checks and balances. And it just is heartening to see a democracy work. And it is something that is the most important thing. And it's a, it's a dream for other other nations and other people to look to. And I, I love my country and I love I love what I'm learning. And I love serving you. <laughs> <laughs> I do. All right. Thank you, Carol. Thanks. I'll go to Bob. Bob, would you like to present what you are working on in the committees you're on as well and your priorities? Uh, sure. I, I hesitate to walk into this love fest, but uh, <laughs> here we go. Um, Bob Hooper, Carol and I split to the 18. Um, I am on house government operations. And I've touched upon a couple of times what uh, that does. It's pretty wide ranging. We have our finger in just about everything that has to do with government except for committees that are designated specifically for certain areas, fish and wildlife, as Carol mentioned, dealt with uh, that particular department of corrections has its own committee. Um, but we still reach out and touch these things sometimes. Um, we, last year, spent a whole lot of time doing redistricting. Um, part of that, uh, the way we jostled things around a little bit, got Burlington an extra seat in the legislature, and we followed through with uh, action on Senate 2 on that side. Uh, we worked out just about everything that had to do with uh, everybody getting a mail ballot. Um, generally speaking, we uh, uh, administer what comes down the pipe from the Office of Professional Regulation, which is a division of the Secretary of State's office, and they deal with regulating everybody from funeral parlors to beauty parlors, uh, barbers to, I don't know, we have any more basket weavers, but anybody that has professional license comes through uh, that office and when they have a change to what they want to do with something, it comes through our committee last year. Uh, we engaged in a discussion and eventually approved uh, Vermont entering a compact that allows nurses to go from state to state and no longer have to get certification from the local nursing board. They, uh, basically have a, a, an agreement with the compact that everybody's training, everybody's certification will mean the same thing. So people can jump back and forth between the states uh, much easier. Well, that was contentious because I, I actually think that some of these things work for us, some of these things work against us. This is one of the things that I'm going to be very interested in seeing whether we net more available health care providers or lose. Um, as just about everybody knows, we are the people that screen and validate the votes that you take on your city charters. Uh, we had a big go around this time on a couple of things that the uh, Burlingtonians put in the charter. Uh, last time, one of them is the uh, rank choice voting thing, which uh, squeaked its way through with some caveats from us um, talking to the city attorney and some other uh, people about expectations and then just like everywhere else in the country everybody quit in the city attorney's office and uh, I don't really know where that stuff stands anymore but um, those are indications of what we do. Um, Non-citizens voting has been a pretty big issue uh, on local elections that come through city charters. Basically, the, the idea with city charters is that under our form of state government, uh, the legislature holds all the power and when somebody makes a change to a city charter, uh, we take action to grant that particular legal entity, uh, the city or the town, uh, the ability to function with a get out of jail a free card in that particular area. There's a, been a push from the Vermont cities and towns for a couple of years to 
to uh, basically say, well, if Winooski can do it, then South Burlington to do, can do it, then that's actually prohibited. Uh, so everybody has to do the same thing that we do, advertise it, vote on it, submit it, um, get it reviewed, take testimony, and then it does or it does not pass as the change that we uh, recommend. Um, one of my priorities and one of the things that we have talked about before is um, the way government works. I mean, technically, we should have our finger in every division of government. Uh, privatization is an issue that we talk about a lot. I want to bring up uh, into a more bright spotlight uh, the function of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, at this point in time, they take a lot of money, they spend a lot of money, but they're not accountable for much in the way of results. So a lot of the trouble we're having with homeless and other issues in Burlington, I think, is because of mental health, not actually having the ability or maybe the desire. We have not taken testimony uh, to deal with the issues. Uh, and that goes down into children also. Um, last thing I'll say about what we deal with, I hope this year we deal with what is going to replace Woodside because at this point um, some really violent teens are looking for a place to be that is secure and so far the state of Vermont doesn't have one. Uh, so they go out of state. I'm going to be pushing in areas of economic development. Uh, I think we need to do more for water quality and that's going to take us into an area of uh, forever chemicals um, and I have a fondness for veterans issues and it's more than just kind of giving away money to people who served. It's uh, making sure people are recognized for what they have done and I'm always eager to take questions and, and I think we'll take questions nice. after Emma goes Bob. Um, thank you for that update and Emma we're gonna um, ask you to go over um, committees you're on assignments um, jurisdiction and interests okay well <clears throat> hello everyone I'm state representative Emma Mulvaney Stanek I represent Chittenden 17 which is from Battery Park up to Ethan Allen and uh, Letty Park roughly and I am uh, at least last biennium I was on the house commerce and economic development committee and the, if you, this wasn't said before, by the way, you can go to any of the 14 House Committee uh, uh, pages on the Vermont Legislative website, and there's a little cute little summary <laughs> on top. And it's helpful because, for example, uh, House and Economic, uh, the House Commerce and Economic Development Committee uh, touches a few things you wouldn't know in terms of the title. So we do do commerce in the sense of business and banking issues and insurance regulation. We also handle uh, issues related to workforce development. Uh, unemployment falls under our jurisdiction as well as workers compensation and then one that wasn't listed for some reason but we do oversee is consumer protection issues and I mentioned that because we took some testimony last biennium and I am anticipating we'll do a large omnibus bill which is a multi miscellaneous configuration bill around consumer protection I'll come back to that in just a second uh, we get one committee in the in the house so that is my primary committee although I serve in or I am a member of several issue based caucuses so um, what does that look like, just briefly? So we, uh, for example, on insurance regulation, we had an interesting bill that went through our committee that first started in healthcare on genetic testing. So this might be something folks are starting to experience with their primary care physician around another data point in your health of understanding your genetic history around your lineage and things you might um, want to know about. And uh, so that changes life insurance. And so life insurance uh, uh, corporations were really interested in understanding how we were going to allow that or not. Vermont would have been one of the first states, to, uh, besides Florida, believe it or not, to allow um, Vermonters to be protected, that that would not be held against you in your premium rating or your uh, rating by the life insurance. That bill did not proceed, but I use as an example that we don't, we don't do the health insurance uh, side of it, but we do the regulation side of it, the, um, the consumer side of that. Uh, we, last biennium, did two very large economic development bills. People often call House Commerce, or have heard it described as a mini money committee, not like Ways and Means and Appropriations, but we mo do move a lot of money and appropriate it 
uh, related to economic um, development and smart ways we can be supporting our economy, all the types of businesses that exist in Vermont, but also uh, in terms of workforce. So we did a large workforce bill last session, um, which touched on a lot of different topics, which I've spoken about here at the MPA, different uh, sectors of our economy, ranging everything from what are we doing with our health care workers, uh, a little bit on nursing. Um, Bob spoke to a little bit on the nurse compact. Um, among many other aspects, trying to move money towards scholarships and helping people um, with training and whatnot to fill our very large workforce needs um, in Vermont. I also mentioned we oversee unemployment. So we spent a lot of time with the Department of Labor in our committee of late because so many Vermonters went, used the unemployment system during the pandemic and discovered that it is a very antiquated system. The IT system, which supports people getting their claims, is decrepit, to be perfectly frank. It does not support the high volume, let alone even a normal volume. Um, and so it is very clunky. And so trying to even make simple changes proved to be pretty much impossible. So we invested a lot of the um, federal money into modernizing, like many states actually, the IT system so that it works better for Vermonters, not only claimants, but employers as well. And we had a task force as well, look, try to look into the system itself and really understand how do we balance the needs of uh, workers accessing that system as well as employers and think about, again, comparably what are other states doing and thinking around in terms of unemployment. Um, how much people qualify for claims, uh, employers that are exempt, et cetera, from that process. Uh, let's see, and just briefly going back to consumer protection, because I think this might be of interest to folks. There is a couple states that have done some pretty comprehensive work around consumer protection, acknowledging the fact that when you pick up your smartphone or you interface with Facebook or whatever, there's so many data points now that get collected from us, whether we know it or not. And this big idea of really understanding the need of consent and data privacy and protection and just knowing what is being shared or held or, or um, collected from you. Uh, so California and Illinois, I believe, I think there was another state, probably Washington, had done some pretty comprehensive um, laws recently. And so we're starting to uh, explore that a little bit around biometric data that's collected, how long companies can store your personal data. Um, even after long you've closed accounts with them, perhaps they could still hold your data. Uh, rights of consumers and issues around tracking. So some of this is a little bit beyond my knowledge, but you know, you have a smartphone, you can be, you know, geo, geo, whatever the terms are, can follow where you're going. And this applies in many areas. Um, and we could get into all the details of other things swirling around us nationally, but these are all very um, important and timely issues. We're thinking about how data gets collected and making sure Vermont can also be a leader around informing consumers and protecting consumers and making sure that corporations are not holding data that they do not need to hold and or sharing it without your consent. Um, special interest areas, if I just have a minute to touch on a couple of those. So uh, because unemployment is an issue in our committee, I continue to, to um, focus in on that. It's a complex system. Last session I introduced an idea of an unemployment advocate that would be a um, like an omnibus person that would help Vermonters navigate the system because, um, again, while we had a huge volume of folks using the system, there are still many folks who regularly use the system and it's complicated. With an antiquated system, it's easy to make a mistake and then suddenly you're in adjudication and without an attorney, it's very hard to figure this all out. So that would be an, um, a role that I think is still relevant to help Vermonters navigate a pretty economically stressful time and have, much like we have a healthcare omnibus person or healthcare advocate, we have a tax advocate, we have similar roles in other parts of state government. I think it makes sense to support Vermonters. Oh, thank you. Um, workers' rights, I talk often about workers' rights. I have a, my, my career has been on a lot of worker rights issues. I have a couple bills I am hoping to reintroduce around closing the gender wage gap, wage transparency, and reliable work schedules, um, supporting workers. Um, and I'll finally end on a gun policy. I'm, I'm looking to uh, explore safe storage. Uh, rules here in the state, waiting periods for gun purchase, and then an aspect of uh, school shooting drills in schools. I have a second grader and she started during COVID and this is the first year she's experienced a, um, a drill and it was horrifying to hear her account as a second grader. It was absolutely horrifying and I think we need to look at our policies and whether or not we are doing age appropriate um, age appropriate things for our children, knowing what the realities we're living in, but there are other ways I think we can do trauma informed ways of looking at how we prepare our communities while we look, work on the larger upstream issues of why we live in a, such a, a violent culture. So 
I'll stick my landing there and I'm happy to answer questions. I hope that wasn't too fast. I've had a lot of coffee today, so thank you. <laughs> we, we need two microphones. So um, this is the microphone for the room and that is the microphone for Zoom. And that is those. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> My fellow Americans. <laughs> I don't know to, who, uh, to whom to address this question actually, but on uh, oversight committees in the House, um, uh, which committee has responsibility for something that my husband and I just learned about, the Vermont Insurance Commission? And are these are these citizens on these commissions who are paid and is there oversight and is there a transparency because we're not seeing the transparency? Thank you, Jeff. Well, I unfortunately, we <laughs> well we do insurance, but I'm actually not sure. I'm a, this is my, it would be my second term if I'm reelected. So I'm gonna write that down and I can get you an answer because I have not heard of that yet. So what was it called again, the Vermont? Uh, insurance Commission. Insurance Commission, okay. And, and my, my uh, guess is that okay. that um, the Speaker of the House, the President Pro Tem of the Senate, and the Governor all appoint people to that commission, and then they serve as other commissions do. Um, but uh, regarding transparency, the, all their meetings should be right on Zoom, right on YouTube, and you can go to the Vermont Legislative website to find um, to find where they are happening and so forth. If you give me your name uh, and email, I'm happy to Charles follow up. Councilor Jang on as an attendee? I do not know. Um, similar for you guys we wanted to start out um, so that when we're at our meetings we're asking better questions knowing what you're working on so um, you know your committee assignments and current priorities and anything else you you think you should add to and while you're okay. working on it <laughs> City Council okay thank you uh, I, this is good this is a good format um, each councilor is assigned to at least three committees sometimes more and there's sometimes task force. Um, the three committees that I am assigned to are charter change, community development and neighborhood revitalization, finally known as CDNR, and the human resources committee. I chair the human resources committee, which is one that is, doesn't get as much um, play publicly because we deal really with internal issues within, within city government and HR policies. This um, last year, we've really been focused on the union contract negotiations. Those are generally three-year contracts, and this was the year that almost all of them came up. So that's been really a huge priority. We've um, negotiated very satisfactorily all of them, uh, but the firefighters, and we're hoping the firefighter uh, contract will be settled soon. Um, I can try to answer questions about that, um, but we, as a committee member, really are at a higher level, and then the council itself, at the end of the day, approves those contracts. 
We also spend a chunk of time on union grievances as a committee. If they go through the internal process, um, people have a right to grieve to the HR committee at a, at a certain level, so that occupies some of our time. Our biggest task this year is a fairly major rewrite of the Human Resource Policy Manual for the city. A lot of that work has been done. Some of you may not realize the city was without an HR director for almost a year and a half. Our neighbor Karen Durfee now is our uh, HR director and she's fabulous and um, has been former steering committee member. Former steering committee member. Um, a lot on her plate. It, the manual's a little bit stalled because of COVID and then um, the change in leadership with the REIB director and we really want it to pass through that office so that'll be a big um, job of the fall. On the charter change committee Bob mentioned how our, our um, state local government works. As he said um, we are what's called a Dillon's Law state. It's very difficult for municipalities in entirety to change things. We have to get permission from state government. So the charter change committee routinely is reviewing things that we want to change within our charter and then bring up to the legislature. Generally those charter changes need a vote of the citizens. Um, we've got three topic areas we're working on right now. One is the legal non-citizen voting change. We're pretty far down the path of that. We've got the language I think settled. We've been spending the summer and now in outreach programs. I unfortunately had to miss your um, September meeting. Uh, I know that my colleague Ben Travers was here to explain that um, and so we're excited about that and I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and, and I want to point out that this is something that we've talked about really since, I don't know, I think it predates me 2017 or 18 so it's not a new idea. It kind of got waylaid again with COVID and I think it's important to remind ourselves that um, in addition to our wonderful New American uh, residents, we for decades had citizens from Canada and other places. I work with many older people who would love to be able to participate in our local government but can't because they're, they're still Canadian citizens. Um, so the, the uh, council has to pass that and I expect that will happen in the next few months. Um, Along with that, we also are going to propose uh, a charter amendment that would give us a little more flexibility in the location of polling places. Um, right now, it says that, that it physically has to be in the ward, um, and that's cumbersome, and it will be more cumbersome potentially if we have some changes with redistricting, um, and we want to look at just flexibility and efficiencies. Uh, when I hope we build our beautiful new high school, that might be a wonderful place for a combined four and seven polling place. Um, so we just want to give ourselves some flexibility to do that. Uh, and I think we'll see that soon. The other um, charter change that <coughs> came, I won't say suddenly, but you all remember a year and a half ago, we voted to allow instant runoff voting um, or ranked choice voting for city councilors that passed. It went through the legislature. Representative Hoover talked about it. It came back with the legislature with some amendment that gave the city some flexibility in the methodology that it could choose. Um, the city, the majority of the council did not choose to explore other methodologies but to use the same methodology that we'd use a decade ago. Um, and that is in the process of being implemented. Um, the special election we going to have on December 6th will be the first time it will be used um, and then again a town meeting. It was um, my personal understanding and a number of counselors as well that we would wait until the town meeting in 23 before we looked at exploring it beyond into other um, city offices. However, this summer um, counselor, former counselor Jack Hansen introduced a resolution that passed that, that asked that um, ranked choice voting also include the office of the mayor and that was sent to the Charter Change Committee and it's in the Charter Change Committee now. Um, at our last meeting there was a discussion about in addition to the mayor actually including all elected officials so that would include school commissioners, ward clerks, inspectors of an election. 
So our next meeting at Charter Change um, will be to review that as um, an opportunity. I um, personally would like to wait until after the March 23 election before we change it to give people an opportunity to become more familiar with it. Um, and I think there's a parallel track happening with some discussions of the state, and I have some concerns about our getting out of sync with the state. The third committee I'm on is the CDNR committee. We deal with um, a lot of community development issues, although um, we have spend probably the majority of our time on housing issues, which is uh, frankly um, overwhelming us. Um, we have worked a lot of stuff. This last year, the primary focus has been on initiatives to serve the houseless, um, and we're picking away at some of that. Um, we've added a special assistant to organize and coordinate houseless issues within state government, although that's only, she's only been there for less than six months. We have the Elmwood um, emergency shelter coming online. We've provided some funding to um, the coordinated entry, which is the major casework program for people who are houseless. Um, and that's a real stumbling point in the system because we don't have enough capacity in that system to meet with all the folks that could benefit from that. So that's a real problem. In sort of a parallel track um, with that, there we're resurrecting discussions that have been um, around how do we manage and deal with policies for people who are camping in the city. Right now, there's somewhere between 70 and 80, at a minimum, that we know of chronically homeless folks um, sleeping out in the city. We will open Elmwood in um, hopefully within a month. That will have 30 beds, but that's, do the math, it's not going to help our problem. Um, so what do we do with people who literally have nowhere else to go? How do, what's the best policy? And obviously the tension with that is um, the degree to which some of those folks are in public parks being used by all variety of the public, including children. Um, there's a tension, there's a conflict. How, how do we manage that? And that will be probably within the next few months a big focus of the CDNR committee. So I can go on, but I give Mark my, I don't know, I don't know how much time I'm supposed to have. <laughs> Have you till 7:55, and it'd be great to have questions okay. at 7:50. So, okay. be good to pass. I'm Mark Barlow. I'm um, the North District City Councilor, which um, encompasses both wards four and seven. Um, I am on, but actually, before I talk about what committees I'm on, I also wanted to describe to you the sort of purposes of the committees um, that we have on the City Council. There are ways for departments to sort of um, queue up issues um, and needs for the broader city council and sort of vet them through the committee structure, but there are also ways for the city council to sort of do extra deliberation on and really do a deeper dive on some of the issues. A lot of times things will come to the city council and then we'll, they'll be referred to the appropriate committee for further uh, discussion um, and analysis. So. With that said, the committees I serve on, um, the, the first one that is the tax abatement committee. And so um, this is a committee where if uh, taxpayers um, want their taxes abated, um, we're a quasi-judicial committee. We have hearings. We're actually having our first hear set of hearings tomorrow. If you're interested in such things, we'll be meeting at Busher at 4 o'clock. But, um, um, but that committee is set, set up to hear those things and, and then refer it to the, um, the full board, our, our recommendation to the full board on each of these cases. And the full board is the full city council. Um, I also serve on the uh, Parks, Arts, and Culture Committee, um, which is a committee that sort of is a liaison, city council liaison to the Parks, Burlington Parks, Recreation, Waterfront Departments, Burlington City Arts, and the Library Department. Um, and so we talk about all things sort of parks, arts, and, and culture in the city. Um, 
two th specific things that um, we're taking up right now is you've probably heard about the dog task force. Um, it was uh, impaneled before I was serving on this committee, but essentially it's looking at a lot of the things related to dogs in the city, um, licensing, um, off-leash areas, um, and that and that those sort of things. Um, and that's um, the committee is is basically taking the uh, input from the task force that was set up. So that's ongoing. Um, and another uh, topic that is um, more current is we've had our first meeting and we're gonna have a second meeting on public safety in the parks. There's been a lot of interest in um, trying to find solutions to some of the activity we're seeing in the parks. Um, and it intersects with like some of the work CDNR is doing. We're looking at some of the camping issues in the park. How do we manage them? How do you enforce some of the ordinance we already have? There's vandalism, um, most notably, um, that was brought to us is the uh, vandalism down at the, um, the accessible treehouse we have at Oak Ledge Park, and how can we manage, manage that? You know, there's graffiti, and there's been some debarking of the tree there, and there's also people who, who are camping there. So how do we, how do we manage that? Um, and we talked about, in our last me meeting, we had um, a number of members from the community came in and related incidents and issues that they see. So we take the testimony and then we um, also, we would en enlist the help of the department heads. So we had like uh, Cindy White, Director White from, from Parks. Um, we wanna have someone from Burlington Police Department at our next meeting. Um, and we had um, Scott Barker, the Chief Innovation Officer for the city come and and they, he, we wanted to understand if there was a role for maybe, if we can't, don't have the, the human uh, resource to, to enforce things, could we at least use technology like cameras or something to sort of keep tabs on things? And I know that's a sort of a fraught topic, but we touched upon it and we're gonna continue that discussion at our next uh, Parks, Arts and Culture Committee that hasn't been scheduled yet. Um, and the last committee um, I serve on is the Transportation, Energy, and Utility Committee. So that's, as it sounds, deals with um, streets and potholes and sidewalks and BED and, um, and even the airport. Um, the city's net zero, energy roadmap, um, and all utility matters. Um, and it's, very, it's a super interesting committee. Um, one of the things I like most about it is, uh, is the field trips. I get to see, I've you know, seen a lot of the infrastructure of the city and it's, uh, it's fascinating that we have the, um, these enterprises in BED and, and in the airport and the, and, and the functions that they serve within the greater city. Um, we had a, we had a, uh, we, call, we call it transportation, energy, and utility. We call it TUC. Um, and yesterday we met and we talked about uh, updates on the North Winooski Avenue um, corridor project and specifically about how we're gonna address some of the loss of parking. There's been some grants that have been set up for um, um, residents and businesses along the part of the corridor that's gonna be have parking displaced and how we can help them um, in this transition by finding additional off-street parking or finding other ways to, um, to manage that parking loss. So we spent some time on that. Um, and we also talked about how uh, the implementation of the new toter program, everybody's gonna have to have the covered recycling toters uh, rather than the open bins that you know, we're, we've been used to having and how, how that's being implemented um, and what that timeline looks like. And we also talked about the, the new Shelburne Street roundabout and how we'll measure um, the effect that has on the traffic in that part of the city when, with queuing on the side streets or queuing in the, um, in the roundabout. So there'll be actually a process for measuring all of that and it'll be done annually for the next bunch of years um, and there'll be reports for that to come to the city council. I actually, uh, I should mention, I chair the tax abatement committee um, and I also, with, the, um, with, with Jack Hansen leaving, I'm now the chair of the TUC as well. Um, my priorities, um, and the other, I guess one of the things that I'm also involved with is redistricting. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the four people on the council that's 
part of the notorious uh, um, redistricting working group. And uh, where we were sort of um, put together to represent the various geographic areas of the city, but also political interests in the cities and try to um, take the input from the ad hoc committee on redistricting and some of the public forums and input we've received and try to craft um, a redistricting plan that's acceptable to everybody. I can tell you at this point, we know that as of Monday, it'll be an eight ward, four district plan, just like the one we have. We just don't know exactly what it's gonna look like yet, but stay tuned. We should have a decision on that on the 7th. And lastly, I'll say my other priority is trying to get a handle on um, reclaiming our, our downtown. I, I really do believe that Church Street and the Marketplace are one of our, you know, iconic symbols of our brand as a city, and I, I really genuinely believe we're losing that right now. We got to figure out a way to to, uh, to manage the issues that are the root causes of the issues, but at the same time, we need to address the acute issues that we have right now. So I know it probably dovetails with some of the conversation that Commissioner Grant has come to talk to us about tonight. But I, I really want to get a handle on, on that. And so I've been meeting with a number of stakeholder groups, um, Burlington Business Association, Church Street Marketplace, various merchants, um, parks, um, Burlington Police Department. And I'm just trying, to, myself and, and others are trying to find a way to sort of address some of us, what we're seeing down there. Because we're losing shoppers, we're losing um, restaurant goers, and we have people that don't want to visit the downtown anymore. And that's tragic. And so I'll stop there. Other questions? Just because we don't have Ali. Right? <laughs> so I got to speak into both. <laughs> uh, Sarah, you mentioned the REIB office. I guess I'm curious if you found a new director for that office and how I know that there was a bunch of uh, subdirectors that also resigned back in the spring. Yes, well, it. Um, we have had the opportunity to interview a final candidate, uh, and we believe she's going to accept the position. Um, she'll need to come to the city council, and I believe it's going to be at our next meeting for a formal uh, appointment. Um, it's public, right? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I just don't know. I think it's so, though. Yeah, I mean, uh, she's a finalist, so I'm assuming it's public. Um, it's a woman from Iowa, uh, and she's got very impressive credentials and is very excited about moving here and likes the Northeast and likes the vibe of Burlington and has worked in a university town. And um, so we're, we're very much looking forward to her uh, final appointment. Uh, the office has been struggling because they are understaffed, and um, but we're hoping this is a good start and that will happen shortly. Great, that's good news, yeah. Um, my other question is you mentioned about alternate voting places, um, and I know this voting place doesn't have to do with, um, it has to, it's, it's in the old North End, um, and I know a lot of often we put voting places at schools, but for some sc schools, it's kind of a, you know, they have to give up a day of whatever. And like Sustainability Academy has, they share their cafeteria and their gym. So the day of voting, those kids, they have to have packed sandwiches. They can't use the kitchen. And half a block away, the city's now had for how many years the one community center? Why isn't voting moved to the one community center? And if we want to push that forward, what process, who do we talk to? Because I've emailed Joe McGee and got no response. Well, I can, I can certainly follow up. Um, the city council has the authority and in fact, technically appoints polling places every year. So there's no reason it can't change. I would gather to say that there are certain 
certain wards are very attached to where they have been, but it's, it's not all that a complicated a process and we should start that conversation. Right now, the biggest impediment is it technically has to be within the physical ward and I don't know um, the boundaries of the I lines. I think it's still within ward yeah. three. Um, so uh, offline, I'm, I'm happy to kind of pursue that discussion. It, it is a problem both we know to use the schools. In Ward 4, we looked at the potential of having it at Flynn, and uh, there was reservations because of the space. My personal opinion, which I've discussed with no one, is maybe we ought to give polling day off for everybody and close the schools. And that would, you know, some com a lot of communities do that, and, you know, work workplaces are giving you the day off. So kind of on a parallel track, I think the city ought to ought to consider that because we haven't got that many big buildings and it wouldn't hurt us uh, maybe twice a year to joggle the school vacation schedule a little bit to give everybody a day off True. yeah I think UVM cancels classes on they do election now day. yes yep. yeah thank you Um, question about when we did our re the reappraisal process for the homes and I did I hear that you guys redid the commercial properties because I know commercial properties were like uh, significantly lower like 20% lower and that was shared across homeowners so with our reappraisal so is I was just I'm just asking you guys hadn't mentioned that you're part of these committees well, so I didn't I mean, know if that was a question in I theory guess. and, and um, Mark may be more up to date of that we know that in the appraisal that was done in when it was 2020, right. so, um, the hotels in particular and anything related to tourist business was way down and undervalued. It is my understanding that the assessor's office is relooking at all of those properties. Um, so it's not the assessor has authority always to reappraise something if they're really out of whack with the market. They typically don't do residential blocks unless something has. Um, changed a lot. Some of you will remember. Um, there was a huge jump in value a few years ago with lakefront properties, so they were done separately. I think the hotels and business, restaurants are going to be relooked at this year. So it's not a, it's not a true community reappraisal. Um, but a commercial reappraisal on some commercial businesses yes, downtown. Yes. Okay, because I know that I've had that question asked yeah, with yeah. with taxes and if. I think what was it about 20% was then spread over homeowners because the pandemic had about a 20% dip in. Well, I, as I understand it, um, home values have escalated a lot. Right. At the same time, particularly because of COVID, commercial values decreased. So the the math number was 20%, and that was just a function of home values increasing at a faster pace than commercial in 2020. Just as a sidebar, um, there is a special task force looking at the reappraisal process. Um, we've not gotten a report back from them, but again, my personal opinion is we need to do uh, reappraisal more often. Um, it's a painful process. Elected officials <laughs> don't like it, um, but I, we waited way too long, and that's we were just too far out of whack. In my opinion, that's what created a lot of the problem. And to be blunt, we are seeing continued escalation in home values right at the moment. So there's an, some swath of pain that may come as well if that gets relooked at. I think the assessor's office priority is commercial properties at the moment. Okay. So I believe they are looking at, like, a spe specifically, I know the hotel industry was um, depressed during the COVID years and that's when the reassessment happened so i know that that specific sector is getting looked Great. at but okay. thank you good evening city councilors nice to see you guys hey um I, I just have a question i know mark here with the parks and stuff and i know um you talk a lot about homeless and whatnot and I know uh, you both did, and um, I, what's our concern? What's our efforts to get the people who are illegally camping in the parks and stuff like that to 
mitigate that. I mean, some of these people are there by choice. Some of them are there because they want to be. Some of them are there because they need to be. I get that. Um, so, what, I mean, we're not asking them to leave at the current time. What are we doing to make our parks a little bit safer? I mean, who's to say we couldn't have an encampment in, uh, in the IAA's uh, backyard? And um, how would that be affected? <clears throat> I mean, those are really good questions, David. And um, I think I referenced, um, we just, well, four or five months ago, we hired somebody within the city to coordinate the efforts. Um, CDNR has been dealing with it. Um, we've add, we are about to add 30 shelter beds, but that won't answer the question because there's 30 or 40 more people. Um, we put some funding into what I call the coordinated entry system. And I'm, I mean, sort of as a practical matter, if, if a city staff, either parks or police get a report, they follow through, um, meet with the person, try to get a plan of action. The frustration, and I'm going to look at our state officials, is where do we send the person? And a huge frustration, particularly with parks department, is people are removed from the parks and they pop up at another park. Um, and in fact, our committee is going to meet with some of the department heads to talk about that. And how do we better align? I, I think there's better work to be done about um, enforcement in what I'm just going to call truly public parks. But we still have this problem of we ask someone to leave and we remove them. Where are they going? And just to add, we now have, um, we've had um, Lacey Smith leading that effort mm -hmm. from Burlington Police Department. Um, and they've been, tr she's been trying to find services for those folks, um, you know, warn them and try to find them places to go. Um, now we have urban park, we have two urban park rangers who work through parks to do, and that's all they spend their time on. And when they came to the Parks, Arts and Culture Committee we had that I described around public safety, they said that's, they're like tapped out just doing that all day long. Um, getting someone um, out of out of a park and then they'll 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 show up somewhere else because um, as Sarah said there's there's not a lot of places for folks to go right now do, do, you, th do you guys think that the, the shelters on Elmwood Avenue are going to actually help that or do you think that's going to attract more homeless people to the city because now we're giving out more resources to the homeless people um, around is that good I think we need more shelter beds. I mean, and so the Elmwood um, proposal is a low barrier shelter with a, a high level of services. We need more of that, whether it's in uh, the pod structure or a building um, structure. We can't f find enough places. I mean, the last was the Champlain, I think it's the Champlain Inn on Shelburne Road. Um, many of the, the transient housing is outside of Burlington, but it's a real, and I'm going to eyeball Representative Odie and perhaps Senator Glick that we're going to, um, we need more resources. It's a, it's a regional problem that's sort of landed in our lap. And I will say this quite publicly, it frustrates me to no end there is a waiting list to get a caseworker. No one should, and, and it may be, you're right, David, people are unaccepting of the services, but they can't even get the caseworker to determine if they need the services. And I'll, and I'll just add that I, I, I do have concerns that if Burlington is the only community that's addressing this issue, um, that we will be the one who has the people who need the services. Um, and so I think there needs to be at least a county, if not you know, some sort of region, more regional focus on, on this. Um, and you know, since we don't have county government, it does probably fall to our to our colleagues in the state to try to help coordinate that with us. I think it's very serious. I've had discussions with several city councilors and with the mayor. We have to take on this responsibility more at the state level. We can't expect our cities and towns to do this on their own at all. The city's doing an incredible job with what it's doing, but it, it can't 
you can't get enough resources. So um, it's something that's a high priority for me. And I see um, Senate candidate um, Martine Gulick shaking her head. Do you want to say something, Martine? No, I, I, you, I completely agree with you. Yeah, and, so and you. we'll be working on that. We'll also be working on getting more funding for the high school. So speaking of high schools, we're going to move on to the school board. Um, Mark, before you go, North Avenue, is the schedule still for 28th, 29th, and 31st? Well, the ha Anything? Halloween, I'm told, as of last night. Oh. So trick Happy or treat. Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, elected officials. I think I'll jump in because we're starting five minutes late and we may be able to make up time. <laughs> um, so thank you for being here, everybody. We're talking about committees and I'm just gonna start with kind of an overview of uh, the relationship between committees and a school board, which is not, not a natural one, actually. Um, when you serve on a school board, you're really working at a level of governance and you're not operational. And sometimes um, a difficulty with committee work is that you become operational. And so it's really important when you do serve on a committee to make sure that you keep um, your, you know, your, stay in your lane, so to speak, and make sure that your work is very well defined and clear. So um, when we first got on the board, there was only one committee uh, the DE&I committee, and since then we've expanded. Um, we we felt the need right away for a uh, community engagement committee because um, there was a lack of. We felt there was a lack of engagement with the city, and um, that was one of our first uh, committees. And we no longer really use that one because we have been engaging quite a bit in the last six years. Um, but in the meantime, we've got some other ones, um, Finance and Facilities, which is a committee that Kendra and I co-chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, and Monica's gonna talk about her committee. Um, but all told, we have five, I believe, is that right? We have four or five? We have Policy and Governance, we have uh, Personnel and Curriculum, uh, curriculum f Finance and Facilities, and DE&I. And, &I. Yep. and Com community engagement is there when we need it, although we haven't, like I said, we haven't been using it. Um, so anyway, I just, I, I want folks to know that because you know that I'm a fan of helping define what being on a school board is because sometimes that line gets blurred and people come to us and they want immediate action on something or they want immediate assistance and we are really governing. So our, our job is to work on the budget it's to hire and assess the superintendent. It's to engage the community around mission, <laughs> vision, and budget. So those are really our, that's our work. Um, everything else is at a district level. So anyway, that's my little spiel. Um, in terms of my current priority issues, you can imagine there's one <laughs> that is really high priority, and it is first and foremost an issue of equity. We have no high school, we have no permanent high school. We are temporarily in Macy's. That lease is gonna run out in three years. And when I talk about equity, I talk, you know, statewide. Why does the biggest high school, why does the biggest city in the state not have a permanent high school? I think it's baffling to many of us. But then even within the city, it's an equity issue. If you are a family that is wealthy, you can send your kid to a private school. Um, the rest of us, our kids go to public schools, and when we don't have one, there is just this incredible um, you know, issue of equity. Um, and moreover, I would say this is an issue of community safety, of community health, um, and um, it just, that's, I would say that's my priority and probably all of us commissioners right now. We're all working very hard to get this bond passed. Um, so with that said, I will pass on to my co-chair of finance and facilities <laughs> to talk a little bit more about that. Good. Yeah, so she covered the bond, which is really what we're, we're working on right now. Um, and we, but we also obviously cover a lot more. Um, we're starting to work on the budget again for this year and we have uh, 
equitable budgeting um, that we came up with last year that kind of mimics what we did at the state level. So um, what we did at the state level with lots of our legislative help and um, coalition from around the state is that we worked on the, the state funding formula to account for greater resources for students who had greater needs. So when we looked at our schools, we looked at, we're, we're doing that same thing with our schools, which is really cool. So for example, instead of every school getting the same library budget, we're looking at the students, the number of students, and the needs of the students, and then we're, we're having a budget based on that. So that's a really, that's really been working well, and we're working with all the principals in all of the schools that identify um, what they're going to do with that additional funding. So it's a very cool kind of mimicking what's been working at the state level. And, and um, Martine mentioned what we do is really policy governance. Well, so we have a couple committees. We also have special committees. So, so she and I were co-chairs of finding the superintendent. So that was a special committee. And this um, student equity committee, basically, for the funding formula was another one that um, that we worked on. And basically, in Burlington, we spearheaded that for the whole state and on the school board level. And Burlington will be seeing about a 15 or 16 percent um, dividend from that. So that is what we have been lacking from the state. And that should come to fruition. We should be seeing those funds in 2025, which is really exciting because that's when the bond, if this bond passes, is also going to be the full extent of the bond, the funding for the bond. So I want people to know that, that we have been fighting for the past couple years to get the resources from the state that we deserve. So this school is just part of this process of, of um, what we need to serve our students. So now we need a physical building. But that funding is coming from the state as well. So I don't want people to forget that. Um, in addition, of course, there's a lot of other things on the facilities. We are trying to maintain the rest of our schools to the best of our ability. And that is always an ongoing job. Um, and I think I want to pass it to Monica so we have time for questions, because I'm sure there's going to be questions. And I'll grab this. Uh, thank you for that, Kendra and Martine. Um, I know Kendra did uh, really spearheaded the student equity formula um, at the state level. And uh, we have high numbers, uh, diversity numbers, second only to the Winooski School District. We have high numbers of uh, children that qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, and high numbers of EL students, Eng English learners. Um, so our district really needs uh, those resources and we've kind of been, you know, with that, well, making do with what we have. Um, I co-chair the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee um, and we meet monthly and we look at um, a variety of things. Currently we're working on some uh, policies within the districts. Um, making sure that uh, there's an equity uh, formula that is applied to new policies. Um, we are passionate about uh, dismantling, uh, about being anti-racist um, and dismantling systems of oppression that have typically been um, in all our schools, um, especially here in Vermont, which is a heavy white state. Um, so we work, uh, now that we have Superintendent Flanagan, our committee works with the Office of Equity, um, and the director of that is Sparks. Um, and so every month uh, we get an update on different aspects uh, in the district. Um, but also when it comes to planning the new high school, you know, ensuring that we have um, gender neutral bathrooms, gender neutral locker rooms, um, so that uh, kids that um, don't identify as cisgender, either male or female, feel comfortable in their school and feel accepted. Um, there's just so much to talk about when it comes to uh, DEI. Um, uh, we also often um, schedule like trainings for the board. 
uh, so that the board can be more aware um, of how we um, govern. Um, let's see. <laughs> yes, yes. I just wanted to lastly say that um, I hope folks are voting. Uh, everyone should have their ballots now, and please fill your ballots out, get them in. Uh, and Tuesday, November 8th is the big day. And uh, we all know we have a very important uh, issue on the bond this year. So, GOTV. <laughs> That's my message. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Well, they need you to hear you on Zoom and. <laughs> we'll have to fine tune this system somehow. I, I was just wondering if you could tell me the yearly cost of the lease for Macy's. Good question. I don't have that exact answer because. Uh, do you know? I thought it was around three million. I think it's a couple million, but I don't have the exact. Yeah, well, just three over three, three but I don't have the exact. We don't have the exact. Three and a half was to get it going. Um, I think it's three. Got that from the state. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Good. Good. Yeah, the it's three and a half. Approximately three million per year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I actually heard from. I I have to ask. Half, so oh. it's not three million. Okay. That might be close. Okay. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> Apple Tree Point, well represented this evening. I know. <laughs> We're not right? tag teaming, I promise. Um, so, kudos on student equity formula. Is that the one you've been working on forever and ever? Why has why do we not know that? Did I not? Did I miss an edition of Burlington Free Press? I mean, really, that's fantastic. So, my question for, for so thank you. Uh, my question is, I didn't get the 15 to 16 percent dividend remark. 15 to 16 percent of what? The state budget? Property taxes. What? It's the money that we get from the state for, our, for education. So, so we're looking at a, a hike of between 15 and 16 percent? We're looking at a decrease. We will get more money, 15 to 16 percent more money from the state for the education funding formula to our, our schools here in Burlington. Carol explained it really well that earlier. The same it's about the tax same. rate that we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The change doesn't happen until 2024. There will be a period of five years. Most of it will happen in the first three years where um, other districts who've been receiving too much will have to come down, will have to be, uh, have their rates go up. And those of us who've been, uh, had our rates up to, uh, who, who have been not receiving what we should have received, will start receiving more and more. At the same tax rate that we are taxed at, we will be able to pull in more money for our pupils. And that will help taxpayers, and it will help pupils it will help the schools absolutely and I is it can I speak or I'm not am I not on zoom when I'm speaking right now No, you're, you're on zoom. okay the, oh, okay great I am on zoom so here's the here's the rub okay it, it, it's a hard thing to message especially you know I I spent a lot of last year testifying because I'm someone who's worked in these over resourced schools if you will um, and I, I asked myself for years, why am I working in this school here that has all of the, these resources? And I come back to Burlington, and we're struggling to just, you know, rub a couple nickels together to get things to, to work. And when I learned about the, this waiting formula, it, it was a light bulb. It really was an epiphany for me to see, oh, now I get it. Um, but it's hard for us to, um, tell this narrative of like, well, we're now going to take all this tax money and we're going to, uh, or this, we're going to take this new rate and give it right back to the taxpayers because um, that's not what we were working on. That's not what we were working for. 
But now that we are potentially passing a bond, hopefully for a new high school, to me that is 100% um, a student resource that we absolutely need to further and better our educating our students. Carol, am I saying that correctly? Well, <laughs> is your yeah, kind of. But it, it's they're, they're not really connected. They're, they're not connected, okay. We want to keep them separate, in yeah. separate buckets. Okay, fair enough. And so what we are, um, what we are working toward is, um, in, there was an over collection of almost $100 million at the state level into the education fund. We didn't over collect. We overproduced, there was an overproduction over, of um, people who were, during the pandemic, they were spending a lot of money on goods. And so we collected way more sales tax than we thought we would. And so between that and some other things, we were at almost $100 million. Of that money, I have been fighting and uh, will continue to fight when we go back um, to bring some of that money back for the PCBs. It's somewhat, um, it's in there under a PCB heading and how will we be dealing with PCBs? And so that will be the, the next um, collaboration um, that we will be working on. It's a fight. It's, <laughs> but you know, it's just, um, we need it. We need it for our kids now, we need it for our taxpayers now and we have to see what we can get there. And, um, and then, so that's for PCB, for the high school to be taken down. Then we have a regional technical center and um, we were able to receive from Patrick Leahy, Senator Patrick Leahy, $10 million to put some of the technical center out at Beta. But we still are spending millions on building the technical center. I'd like to see some money for that since it's a regional technical center. And then also, there used to be a um, one-third help from the state. If you, one-third construction aid, if you were constructing something, you got one-third aid. Six years ago, at the same time that I asked for a change to the weights, I asked for construction aid to be reinstated. And since then, we've asked over and over. And um, that has not gotten a, a warm reception because we have so many buildings in the state to take care of, as you might imagine. However, um, we're going to still push for it and see where we can come up with more money um, to bring down that 165 million. So that I wish that we could have come up with these things before the bond vote so we could say, well, these things are in line to come on. But we, we haven't been able to, but it took, I knew there was a problem with the weights in the, eight, in the 1990s at the very end, because I worked on that formula to make it fair for Burlington. And so the minute I got to the state house, I have been fighting, that took six years, and it took a lot of people um, to get that. And now we're gonna work on this next thing. And Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Thank you so much. We could, we could go on, but we should probably stop. It's, we've gone over now. Ten minutes over. Any other questions for school board? All right. Thank you very much. Good evening. I want to welcome you, Milo Grant, from the Police Commission. I just wanted to read what you wanted to accomplish when you sent your request to present. Yes, it's the, a lot. <laughs> the Police Commission would like to do more community outreach to encourage people to watch the monthly meetings, review what the PC, Police Commission, is working on, discuss current public safety issues, and get community feedback. So that's why you're here. Yes, so. so welcome. Thank you, thank you. Greetings, uh, words four and seven. Um, thank you for having me. I have a lot I wanna push through today. Um, I want to educate people on where to find information. 
right? We are on Facebook too much, we're on Reddit too much, and those are not the experts. So I want to encourage you to watch certain meetings. These meetings can be watched while they're live. These meetings can be watched um, almost all of them are recorded by Town Meeting TV and can be watched at a later time at your convenience. You don't have to watch the whole meeting at once. You can watch 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. You can watch different segments. I'm going to go over a couple of reports of the Chief's report. That is something that everyone should look at. Take five minutes every month and look at that report. And that answers a lot of questions. Um, and I want to give you uh, an update on um, recruitment and where that stands um, and if we have time my personal point of view about things because there's some things that I'm hopeful about there's some things that that scare me coming down the line I think some things are gonna get a hell of a lot worse before they get better um, and that'll be a frank conversation uh, so having said that, let me start off, um, and I think what I'll do is as I go through different things, I'll ask for questions as, as we go along, and then at the end, we can do full-on question answer if we have uh, some extra time. So the police commission meets once a month, and it's generally the fourth Tuesday of each month, but as we're getting into the holiday season, it might change in November and December. But on the, city, on the city's website, you click on calendar. It's a nice big button that says government meetings. You're able to click on that and scroll down, look for the police commission, click on that. You have the Zoom link, uh, you have the agenda, and you have any reports that are attached that we review. Um, we, as a meeting, when we meet each month, we usually have, we have the chief's report each meeting, and then we have a variety of topics. We have been trying to do things where we get updates on uh, current issues, such as recruitment and uh, the data related to the incidents in the city, and we also try to have speakers, and we try to have these speakers address things that people want to know about, information um, that they need. So just to highlight some things that we talked about recently, um, we, there was a mental health summit back at the end of August, and this mental health summit was made up of individuals uh, from Howard Center school-based clinicians, their crisis services, age well, and more. Um, the discussions were centered on what role the city has in supporting the local system of care um, around mental health. Um, key takeaways identify the need for stronger coordination between city, Department of Mental Health, and the Agency of Human Services. Uh, identify the need for advocacy and continued partnership with local mental health partners. Identify need and desire for coordinated communication, uh, coordinated communication, coordinated communication, coordinated communication. That really came through as a problem. All these different agencies within the city and the state not working together uh, in the best possible way to assist us with these um, issues that we are, are seeing. Um, identify the need for continued relationship building between mental health workers and the police department and much, much more. So this specific report on uh, crisis advocacy and intervention programs um, is really an important read. Everyone should take a few minutes to read it. It's available um, under the September meeting agenda. And it, it doesn't say how to solve everything. It says what we need to be doing going forward. It says we're here this way now. These are the issues we're facing. How do we move forward? Um, and we definitely need the state to do more. VIA, Vermont Interfaith Action, did a very interesting presentation, a Vermont guide to community engagement with local police departments. Um, during the protest of 2020, that really came out as a big issue for people. And it came out as a huge issue for the city of Burlington. And it's probably the main issue that I talk about um, ad nauseum. If we have better communication, we would have, within the community, better support. We have individuals who are all the way over here. They will support the department no matter what. 
Let them go out there, bust a few heads. We're great. Then you have people over here who like abolish the police. We don't need police on the streets. And then you have most people who are here. Most people are here. So how do we get everyone where they're more on the side of supporting the police? And we do that with positive engagement. Um, and some of that engagement has to be on behalf of the department as, as well. Um, their report lists things that they looked at, the case for civilian oversight, a building trust and legitimacy, um, technology and media, officer trainer education, uh, safety, wellness, and more. So that is a great report that's also listed under the September meeting. Uh, past speakers we've had have talked about officer wellness, have talked about um, uh, trauma-informed policing, right? Trauma that officers experience, trauma that the public could potentially experience um, when interacting with officers. Uh, it's We've tried to educate people on um, the experiences that officers have policing. I can guarantee you the average Burlingtonian doesn't have an understanding of what officers have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, I have done ride-alongs. I'm going to be trying to do more in the future. And so th there's things that if, if people should be aware of. Um, and so we try to have speakers that express that. Uh, last night we had an excellent speaker. Her name was um, Tammy Buddha. She's with the Howard Center Street Team. Very, very interesting, mandatory listening. Um, she did something on de-escalation presentation, but she talked about her work as a street outreach person. She talked about being, in particular, um, they do a lot of work in downtown area and around City Hall Park. So they, when they can be proactive, they are trying to reach out to certain clients that they're aware, maybe homeless, trying to work with um, assessing, uh, improving their stability, I should say. Uh, but they do answer calls. They answer calls from dispatch. They answer calls from merchants. Um, they do take calls directly from clients and also citizens who see something that's concerning or family or friends of individuals who are concerned. Her um, observations of the change that's occurring downtown and in the parks was very, very interesting, um, albeit admittedly stark at times. We, unfortunately, after having gone through the opioid epidemic, seen an improvement, we've now regressed. Now we have meth. The city has meth. And this is scary, because meth is very different. Uh, when we talk about de-escalating, it's very difficult to de-escalate someone who's on meth. Meth affects you differently. Um, I do recommend uh, Seven Days recently did an article on this. It is well worth reading to have uh, an understanding of meth, and meth is going to make things very difficult for us. Uh, the increased paranoia makes it very hard to de-escalate someone. It's more difficult to get off of. Uh, you're more likely to relapse multiple times. So meth coming here is a very, um, it's scary. It's scary. She also said she noticed a new element of individuals coming into the community specifically to prey on addicts. And that was concerning. So if you go into City Hall Park and you're a street team member and you're known by everyone, you're losing some social currency, as she put it, when people no longer feel safe and they, they don't come in. Um, she talked about increased threats. She said outside uh, Chittenden County, they're encountering um, having guns pulled on them more. Um, inside of Burlington, there's an issue with knives. Uh, so street outreach team members are asking for vest. Uh, but she was very, very interesting. And um, like I said, not necessarily uplifting, but information that we need to know. Stay off Reddit, stay off Facebook. Talk to people who are doing the job and listen to what their observations are. Um, also with the uh, police commission, we encourage people to send us commendations, right? Everyone complains a lot about policing. If you have a positive experience, we want to hear about it, and we will talk about it during our meeting. Okay, great. If I could have the um, 
police, uh, the chief's report up, please. And thank you. Any questions about uh, those details, about what the commission talks about? And Could you give the name of that article that you just mentioned? Not the seven days word to, was it a video clip? Um, it wasn't a video clip. It was actually an article. It was about meth. It was within the last three weeks. In seven days? In seven days. And was there, you said don't use Reddit? Right. Well, what we tend to have when, when people get information on Facebook and Reddit is they're not getting correct information. You know, and sometimes you get posts from people who don't even live in Burlington. I mean, I've read some really outrageous stuff where people are being uh, really alarmist in some areas. I, I've been, I live very close to downtown. I'm downtown all the time. If I'm walking down a waterfront uh, park, I come back up to check out what's going on at City Hall Park. I'm looking, my eyes are open. And I can tell you this past weekend was fabulous. I'm sure a lot of the businesses and restaurants were very happy, a lot of tourists in for fo uh, foliage. Um, it was bustling, um, it, was, it was safe. You read some of these posts, they'll make you think this is an active war zone, and it's just not. And, and we're not the only ones. Not that that's supposed to necessarily make us feel better, but we do need to have an understanding that there are national trends at play and that they are affecting us here in Burlington and in the state. For example, we look at Bennington. What's Bennington? 15, 16,000 people. They've had 15 gunfire incidents. They literally have drug gangs from Massachusetts preying on disadvantaged kids, sending them up here to deal because we have that thirst in our communities, right? Um, so we can't incarcerate our way out of all of this. That's a cold, hard reality. You can't incarcerate our way out of this. There's only so much room, and as uh, someone mentioned earlier, the lack of um, space for, for teenagers. You know, the corrections department was like, we have no programs for youth. We have no space for youth. We have no training for youth, right? We have to start to think as part of the overall public safety system dealing with root causes. So yes, taking people off the street that are actively committing crimes, but stopping the pipeline, paying more money for, we've increased to be more competitive to try to get officers here, but we need to pay social workers and street team members more money too, because there's the same labor shortages there. They need people as well. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's a lot of different things and it, it's not related to politics. There's so much about politics that it's really unfortunate. We're literally wasting too much time on politics and not enough time talking about solutions. You could change over the entire city council tomorrow and it's not going to change public support if other things aren't going to be done. It's not going to change the level of incidents if other things aren't going to be done. So um, that is definitely a concern that I have. Was it just that one article or were there two? Uh, regarding um, meth, it was one article, yeah. But I thought it was a very detailed article that really informed people about the drug if people aren't familiar with it because it's here. It's here and it's, it's very, very, very different. Right. Um, so the first page i want to say I, I call him officer corey i'm glad he's back um he just started he had been on a military leave so i'm happy that he's come back uh next page please um this is our sworn officer head count this is always included in the report so if you need any information on that just always go to the most recent report and as of october 1st we're at uh, 62 officers next page please the revised priority response plan. Um, so this is going to list the uh, category, uh, how the incidents are categorized, and that's from priorities one or two. Um, priority one is uh, situations that involve immediate life safety. And so priority one, because they're number one, they're going to get the first response from sworn officers. Additional categories might allow for a CSO, and that will be highlighted. You'll see yellow highlighted for CS, uh, CSOs. And then um, there are a 
couple of items that get referred to online reporting, such as uh, check fraud and things like that. So this is a very interesting read. Um, I recommend reading through it once if you've never seen it to have an understanding of how incidents are triaged if necessary, right? Because they're going to go to priority one, then they're, if they can't get out to something that's listed as a priority three, it'll be triaged to be dealt with eventually, but priority one, someone should be going out. Um, I want to quickly advise concerning uh, drug activity. If you see um, drug deals occurring, if you see um, individual, if you, uh, there are people who live next to homes and they know things are happening. They see people going in and out. They have needles being left. They see people doing drugs in cars. They might see um, cars from out of state or, or different cars, different license plates, using the drug, t drug tip line on the police department's site. You just go to the city site, click on police department, and it's one of the first things you see, and it's an online tipping line for drugs. You might, calling dispatch, I would not do unless there is an immediate threat to someone's safety. You want to be reporting the activity online because this allows the department to track what's happening across the city. And if people are saying at this house on this particular address, this is what I'm seeing, and neighbors continue to do that, that allows the department an opportunity to focus their resources and possibly engage federal partners. Unfortunately, we can never know exactly what investigations are going on where because they can't talk about it. They, you, if you talk about it, you might compromise the investigation in some way. But provide the information. Um, definitely don't think it's, it's a hopeless situation. Next page, please. Incident volume. Um, as of October 15th, we have year-to-date incidents. Um, so as you can see, the volume we had in 2017, 18, 19, uh, the quote-unquote COVID years, 2021, and uh, where we are as of 2022. So for the year-to-date incidents, we now year to date, I think this is the first month where we are surpassed 2021 for sure, and now we have surpassed 2020 year to date. Um, at the very bottom, it mentions 16% have been stacked according to the priority response plan. Next page, please. Um, this is a graph. Uh, each year has a color, and it shows um, 2022 is black, and it shows how that is trending. Um, I did have a concern, which I did raise to the chief, and we did discuss it on last night's meeting, and you can certainly uh, tune in for that full conversation. I did not agree with adding 2017's traffic volume and foot patrols to 2022's overall incident volume. I don't agree with that because those traffic volume is from 2017, it didn't occur in 2022. So if we're looking to use uh, data for deployment, I, I personally, um, I had trouble with that. And I know from constant community feedback over data, um, we want to keep it as clean as possible. Now I do understand. Uh, this, this is this year's data, but you're saying if 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 we were right, and I I don't think that's appropriate. We're going to have to agree to disagree because I don't have a lot of time. I don't think that's appropriate to say if we were to add data from 2017. So that happened in 2017 to 2022. I I disagree. I understand what the chief says because traffic stops were discretionary, and. We know that officers right now don't have the time they need to be more proactive. It's very reactive right now. And in the case of the priority one response plan, it can be triage at times, depending on the day and the time of the day and what's going on. I just think that that data shouldn't be there. Happy to talk to you about it further. The extended conversation is uh, recorded on our meeting. Next page, please. Uh, this is a graph of priority one incidents. Um, as you can see, they are scanning uh, higher. Um, next page, please. 
Okay, these are selected Valcor incidents. Valcor is the uh, system that our officers use to keep track of what they, the incidents that they are responding to. Now, a couple of things, um, two things can be true at the same time, which is that historically incidents had been decreasing, but and that's overall incidents, but specific incidents are increasing, right? That's totally possible. So if we go through the different categories, things that, um, uh, drug use has really got me concerned, especially with meth, because in our particular ward, I have lived uh, predominantly in wards two and three, I own my home in, in three, we have seen a lot of drug activity and we have been um, bombarded with crimes of opportunity. And in the late spring, early summer, I could see this really spreading out and it did, where it started to really hit the other wards more than it ever had. So packages being taken, Christmas is coming up, folks. You want to sign for those packages. If you can't sign for the packages, they need to be delivered to a place that will accept it. Or you need to have them sent someplace else where you pick them up. Um, if you have a package that says it's been delivered and it's been potentially it's stolen, go out and look for stuff. Drug addicts are opening these boxes and they're looking for things that they can eat, sell, or wear. If they can't do it, some of the stuff is just being discarded. Many people have talked about walking up in the street and finding some of the things that they've ordered that's in the street because the person didn't want it. They were manic. Uh, so when we take a look at things like larceny, that's uh, mental health issues, that, uh, you know, overdose, uh, the increase in stolen vehicles. Uh, my God, that is definitely related to drugs. So many people who have had these vehicles stolen talk about um, needles being found in them, where there was clearly activity. Uh, there have been some cases when or police officers have recovered some of these videos. People are like asleep in them or passed out in them. Um, lock your doors, lock your, you know, don't keep spare keys, don't keep anything in your cars. These are very, very simple things that for a very long time this area didn't worry about. When I got here from New York City 35, 40 years ago, I was like, what's wrong with you people? You gotta lock everything. <laughs> you know, I was always doing that. But now it's well and truly we have to take those basic steps. And it sucks. It sucks. We don't want to, we don't want to live this way. I get it. But a lot of these individuals who are drug addicted, they're looking for something quick and easy. How many of you have seen people trying to open car doors? I've seen that five times in the last few months. That's a lot. That's not just people talking anecdotally. That is what I have seen. And so if the doors are open, they're going to grab stuff. And so there's a lot of that happening. People leaving their cars running with their keys in it at, at quick stops, going in and get a cup of coffee. Someone gets in and drives their car away. So the, there's a lot driving this uh, related to drugs. And so as, as I said, yes, we want to get drug dealers off the streets, but someone's coming right behind them if we can't control the addiction in our community, if we can't get counseling. It was mentioned earlier, people getting caseworkers. You can't get a caseworker. You can't get treatment on demand. We don't have beds. The state needs to do more. Um, the mayor recently seemed to believe, uh, he is now understanding, uh, especially with regards to meth, he has been, as he says, talking to the governor. He believes the governor understands the issues. But when I watch the gubernatorial debates, I don't hear a man who understands the issues. So it's important, our uh, state legislatures, thank you, continue to talk to them about it, and continue to direct concerns to the governor's office because we need an influx of money. We don't even have beds for um, what are sometimes called low barrier. If you have someone who has mental health issues and you jail them and they get out, what's gonna happen? The same behaviors. They have to have treatment. If you have someone who has mental health issues and they're dangerous, it may not be appropriate or humane to incarcerate them where they're a risk to other prisoners. They need to be in a facility that, that holds them um, in a safe manner to, to 
protect them and others. So these are the resources that we have and that we're sorely lacking. You know, we lost Waterbury Hospital. Maybe we didn't need all the beds that they had, but we sure as heck need a lot more now. Um, so these are really state level issues. Uh, so th these um, Valcor incidents, definitely a page worth looking at and uh, taking a look at the trends um, over the last few years and also in the types of incidents. Uh, next page, please. Uh, this is comparing a five-year, uh, year-to-date average. Uh, the chief will add up the numbers uh, from the last five years, divide by five, and then do, uh, so it's 2017 to 2021, and then compare to 2022. Uh, dramatic, uh, once again, huge on larceny, gunfire, stolen vehicle, overdose, mental health issues. Um, next page, please. This uh, is a page that is tracking gunfire incidents. Uh, the bottom is sorted by the type of incident. Uh, white is a gunfire incident. The light blue is a gunfire incident known to be at a person. The dark blue is a gunfire incident where someone is struck, uh, henceforth a shooting, and a um, red is where someone has died. So this is kind of breaking it down where we can see the increase uh, that has occurred over the last several years. Um, this is unfortunately a statewide and national trend too. Doesn't make us feel better, but we, we need to be aware of, kind of like COVID, we need to know what's happening every place else. If all of a sudden every place else is having surges, then we need to start to protect ourselves um, to prevent a surge in our area. Um, we have to look at what other places are doing. Is it working? Is it not working? Um, these are things that I believe that we need to think about. Next page, please. Uh, these are the totals of available officers. So we have 62. Um, minus uh, officers that are on leave, um, supervisors, detectives, airport officers, special assignment that leaves 21 officers on patrol. Uh, next page, please. Building other capacity. Uh, this is talking about our community service officers who, um, when we talked about uh, the previous page that showed the priority one response plan, it indicated types of incidents that could be responded to by uh, CSOs, community service officers. The, the, uh, we're budgeted now for 12 so trying to hire more and then the community service uh, support liaisons these are essentially uh, similar to the street team social workers um, who are embedded uh, they have their expertise in mental health and substance abuse disorder as well as homelessness you know and all these things are related if you have a substance abuse problem or mental health problem that can lead to instability. Maybe you can't work. Well, then that will put you in a situation where you could be homeless. All these things are related and need to be attacked from a number of different directions. Um, hopefully to hire three more CSLs uh, by July of 2023. Is that correct if I'm reading right? Thank you. Um, next page. Milo, could I check in with you on? Uh, sure. How much more presenting you'd like oh, to? Oh, we're, we're almost there. Because um, I think everyone has questions. Sure. And it would be great to have dialogue, too, with you. And I'd like great. a clarification on something, too, which okay. might take a few minutes. No problem at all. <laughs> um, range training day, if we could go to the next page. Recently, our leadership staff for our department went to a conference, the International Association of Police Chiefs in Dallas. Next page, please. Uh, this page shows some of the different types of uh, panels that were available to them. Next page, please. Uh, next page, please. This is uh, the increase in salary point for starting pay and the top pay, as well as the, sign of the hiring bonus. Um, additional benefits that have been added to be more competitive in the labor market and to attract um, officers. Next page, please. 
Great. Um, I will say uh, with regards to the chief's report, while he was at the conference, he did visit um, a couple of colleges in the area uh, specifically to do some recruitment. Um, they attended panels uh, discussing oversight. Uh, I was very thankful to hear that attended a panel on uh, looking at historical um, trends in policing um, because a personal concern of mine and a number of people in the community has been racial uh, disparities. We had a conversation about, you know, have we haven't gotten any lateral transfer applications yet? The answer was no. Um, the feeling was that the atmosphere has not changed enough in the city uh, to Someone feels that the money is still not enough to come into a community where they feel that there isn't the support that they would like to see. Um, politics was blamed. The police commission was blamed. I didn't think that was necessarily fair. Um, we're doing a lot of things differently, but we're certainly doing a lot of things that the community called for. Um, and I will leave that there. I would, you had a yeah, Com so yes. I'm actually, I'm, I'm really glad that Chief Murad came because um, you both brought up a point. So I attended online the commission meeting and I, you brought up about statistics from 2017 and you both are at like a disagreement about what those mean and I could not understand either of your points. Um, and so a, a huge passion of mine is um, breaking down a lot of the discord we have in our communities. Um, and I think a huge part of that is just misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we could leave this meeting tonight just understanding, um, I'd like you to speak and then have um, Chief Murad speak to uh, about that statistic because I can see this one incident snowballing and becoming bigger, that there's like a misunderstanding um, about whether or not that's like a valid statistic. Sure, I believe we can talk about the need for more proactive policing. I believe that if we didn't have to triage, we could look at things again like community policing and other things like that. Um, I do not believe it's appropriate to say traffic stops that occurred in 2017 should be included to say if we include, right? Because that's what it says. It says if we include, then we're looking at more incidents than we ever had. I'm like, no, we, we shouldn't include those. We're, we're not going to include those because it didn't happen in 2022. And I understand it says if we include, I'm just not comfortable with that statement. I, I oh, Can you clarify? They're the tw I guess that's this is where I'm not understanding. Are they not included for every year in just 2017? Like, what's the that was the, the number in 2017 is the number in 2017. Tra we could do a whole meeting on why traffic stops declined, but they did, and they declined sharply. Um. So were they included for the other years too? And you're just saying that that may yeah they're the they're in the other year they're in the other years yeah okay yeah okay. they're if they're, I believe in okay. yeah if a traffic stop included in a year it should be included in the year, and figuratively just to say if we added I just around numbers and incidents I think we just need to be very clear with people and not. Um, I know the chief doesn't like the word mislead, but that that's that's my feeling. I, I just th those incidents happen in 2017, and we shouldn't talk about including them in 2022 um, because they didn't happen in 2022. You know, we're in 2022, and they're not happening. Uh, but we can talk about the need to be uh, proactive and the need to uh, for community policing, uh, should we be able to increase the staffing of our department? I think I'm understanding your point better. If Can you um, speak at a, a microphone so you're on Zoom as well? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. and uh, th Thanks for 
Thanks for giving me a chance to, to sort of clarify it. Um, and thank you for going through that report so, so thoroughly. I do those reports myself. I do them every single month. I don't have staff to do that. The, this is something that I put a, a good deal of time into. Um, they are all available online. You can go see uh, the, the cumulative progression of them for the past two and a half, uh, almost two years. Uh, and I do think that they are a key component for being transparent. Being transparent is incredibly important. Uh, our data is, I believe, the best police data in the entire state. Um, I think that it is uh, very, very thorough, and, and I'm happy to have it up there. With regard to this particular issue, it, it stems from the notion that, that overall incidents have been declining over the past several years. And in fact, they have. But a decent percentage of that decline has been owing to a diminishment of proactive police work, including traffic stops. So we have diminished traffic stops on purpose for quite some time. Uh, it was driven in part to address racial biases that were being seen in our traffic stops. And if you look at that slide that shows a table of all the numbers, you'll see that traffic stops were well over 2,700 in 2017, and they're barely over three uh, year to date this year. So we've lost a huge number. I am simply saying that if we did traffic stops at the same volume that we once did, which is a proactive choice by officers, our incident volume would not be that much lower than in previous years. In fact, it would be almost identical. And what that indicates to me is that what we're seeing with regard to incident volume and the decrease of incident volume is not a diminishment in how often our neighbors call us and how often our neighbors want our services and how often people in our city need us. This is a point I've been making since June of 2020 because the data was clear back then as well. If I took uh, traffic stops and foot patrols, both of which are proactive officer decisions uh, they are generally driven by an officer's observing something, not a call for service, not somebody saying, hey, this is happening, can you do something about it? It's about officers saying, I've got some time, or this is something that my agency has told me is important, or this is something I believe is important as an officer, and I'm going to go do that. Those fell away for a combination of reasons, partly because our community was saying traffic stops aren't important anymore. Our agency was saying traffic stops aren't important anymore. And uh, as a result, officers said, I can't. Now we have a situation where we simply don't have enough officers. We're routinely patrolling the entirety of the city with two or even three officers for 44,000 people and 15 square miles, and they are running from call to call, and they don't have time to stop cars. My point in making that hypothetical, and it does say if we were to do these things, was to say that if we took the traffic volume that we used to see, a proactive officer decision, uh, and added it to our current numbers, we'd be right back up at the old levels of total incident volume. And that's indicative of the fact that although incident volume has shrunk, it hasn't shrunk because people are calling us less and that's really the whole point of that so am I understanding you correctly that it's your experience that traffic violations themselves haven't necessarily gone down it's the intervention on them that's gone down yes and I think that I think that I think and that our, our counselors will agree with that because we hear it all the time we hear it all the time from every single NPA in the city every single ward in the city the fact that people are incredibly frustrated there is a you know there's a watch group over on Star Farm that is tremendously frustrated right now about the number of cars that are rolling through the intersections uh, in the vicinity of the Star Farm playground and the Star Farm dog park and the bike path. They're just charging right through them. And what we haven't seen so far, and I see it too in my neighborhood. I live over in Apple Tree. Uh, we see it at the intersections of, of the bike path and Apple Tree Point Road. Um, what, what we're seeing, however, is we have not seen a tremendous spike in accidents with injury and fatality. And that's the most important one for us. Crashes happen, and they're important too. Nobody likes to be in one. But what really drives our metrics with regard to how are we going to deal with traffic in our city from a safety standpoint is traffic crashes with injury and or fatality. We haven't seen a tremendous increase in those, although this year's are higher than any year since 2017. So something has changed this year. Have we reached an elasticity point at which we really do need to go back to traffic enforcement because that has a role in uh, changing driver behavior? That's possible. As a city, we've decided that driver behavior is better addressed mostly through engineering standards. We've, ended, we've put in a lot of different kinds of, of roadway uh, you know, obstacles, tables, uh, speed humps, speed bumps. We've changed the number of lanes. Everyone knows what uh, challenge North, uh, North Avenue was, right? I mean, I don't know. I, maybe I shouldn't even bring it up. Uh, <laughs> but, we, but we, <laughs> but, well, and, and, and definitely right now when it's all great, you know, it's, uh, the, the surface is uneven. But by, by Halloween, right? Is that what we said? 
said? Okay. Um, uh, so that obviously is, is you know, something that we've done as a city, is, is understand that engineering is often a better opportunity to address driver behavior than enforcement. But enforcement has a role. And we may very well have reached a point where our enforcement is too low with regard to traffic, stop, uh, excuse me, traffic violations. But at this moment, I couldn't change if I wanted to. I would love to park a cruiser at the intersection uh, over on Star Farm and address that neighbor's uh, real concerns. As I said, I have three officers to patrol the entirety of the city. And I do have CSOs. I'm, I'm building up our, our ranks of CSOs. In fact, I got a picture today of a CSO parked over there because there's a dog park and that's the vicinity he goes to. <laughs> but he can't enforce traffic laws. So, you know, this is, we made a choice as a city that we didn't want as many cops as we had, and we wanted other kinds of things. And we're learning that cops do a lot more than we thought they did, and a lot of other roles can't do the things that cops are allowed to do. So I think, just to clarify, I think where, what I'm hearing is where the disagreement lies is not necessarily with data, but what data and what maybe qualifies as data was included in that report. Is that kind of where the disagreement is okay so uh, i i'm i'm going to try and keep this um because this is going places that i i i didn't want to go but so when we had uh the vote i think what's very important is the city council vote didn't vote to fire officers there was that vote did not fire officers it was to reduce the number uh, by attrition, and then the hope was to get these additional positions um, to, as we talked about earlier, attacking some of these issues in multiple ways. When you talk to officers, they don't have, um, you know, they want more training regarding mental health. They, they don't have that training that a, a social worker has. They have some training, but they don't have it. Officers repeatedly express being at times overwhelmed by uh, mental health uh, incidents involving mental health issues uh, because you tend to see the same people over and over again. So it was supposed to be by attrition, but we had all these things, all these forces come to bear in our country and officers left far more than anticipated. They left of their own free will, not just in Burlington and other cities and towns in the state and across the country. Just Google it. It's, it's part of the overall labor force issue, but in particular, there's a lot of change um, in the labor force and policing going on across our country. The number one reason they leave is because they do not believe they have the support in the community. It's the number one reason. Now, sometimes they blame city councilors. I will say again, the entire city council can turn over tomorrow, can have all Republicans, all Democrats, no progressives. That's not going to change the level of support in the city. What's going to change the level of support in the city is real engagement, which I still believe can be done now, like I'm doing now, um, and addressing community concerns. Um, Traffic stops are really loaded, folks. They're really, really loaded because you have basic traffic stops, you know, someone running through a stop sign, and then you have other stops that are called pretextual stops, uh, which can be a tool when trying to build a case against uh, people who are trafficking drugs. And then you have a combination thereof. Our city, unfortunately, like a lot of other cities and towns in the state, had issues with racial disparities and traffic stops. So you don't necessarily know who the person is if they're driving by. In some cases, you might if it's a pretextual stop. You're sitting, you're looking at a drug den, drug house, trap house, whatever. Individual comes out, probability that they might have made a buy. How can I, what, what is it about their car that I might have a reason to stop them to initiate a search, right? Well, if you are just only doing that with BIPOC people, that's a problem. If you are more likely to stop a black individual who was less likely to have contraband, that's a problem. And that was a problem that we, we were having. Um, so traffic stops, it's a very interesting article. It's several years old. Go into seven days and Google force reboot. 
force reboot. When I served on the committee to review co policing policies and that article came out, it was very telling to me that at that time, there were a lot of concerns within the department and within officers themselves about the, um, the trend in how traffic stops were handled and why they were stopping traffic stops. It wasn't like the issue around racial disparities was being addressed. It was more the fear that if um, someone was sued, the city wouldn't have their back or their apartment wouldn't have their back. It's called Force Reboot, and there were some interesting quotes from the individual officer who at the time was on the uh, union's leadership. So I definitely recommend that, and please feel free to email me at if you have any questions about it, because it's a very interesting article and, and gives you an insight to what was going on at that time. So um, we are over our time. Okay. Were there any other points you wanted to make that you would feel like, oh, just really, really encouraging people to watch the meetings, read some of the reports, even if you just read the reports, but um, you get the information that's telling you what's going on, being informed, talking to your representatives, getting in contact with the governor's office. We need funds in this city. And we need funds immediately. People, someone was talking to me about graffiti. I was like, I don't care about graffiti, I care about meth because that should be the top priority over you know, meth and the other drugs. We Thank you. We want to have a dialogue about, could we have this be an ongoing part of the NPA? I would love to do that. Public safety, yep. you know, slot. Absolutely. But not ongoing. that it becomes confrontational. No. Right. No. I, mean, I, I felt very uncomfortable here it, dialogue. Well, and that's why it's, I, it's an it's an it's an issue, you know. And I would love, uh, Chief Merritt. I have previously asked for for uh, mediation. I I would love it. We it has been very very tense. Um, civilian oversight is bumpy. Well, communication is a great starting point. So absolutely. I, I thank you both for clarifying that. I just uh, I didn't want it, that to hang in the air. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No. M. E. Grant at burlingtonvt.gov, Grant at burlingtonvt.gov. You can uh, email myself. Um, Kevin Garrison tends to work in the evenings, so but his email address is available online. Um, Shereen Hart, unfortunately, uh, recently resigned her p uh, position, so uh, I'm sure there'll be notice on that going out. But um, well, thank you so much for coming and sharing. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Everybody.